and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that isn't afraid to give the middle finger to quality equipment and good ideas. Well, uh, it seems like things have been very audio-driven thus far this season, uh, particularly in my little ongoing quest to try and fix things up around here a bit. And I figured since we're already in this territory, maybe it would be fun to take things and just go in the polar opposite direction for an episode. So with that in mind, today I've got a double header for you of a pretty decidedly anti-audiophile stuff. So first up, we're going to take a look at the uh, actually very much requested forerunner to effectively the Walkman namely the play tape. And then after that, we're going to almost entirely dispense with audio so we can take a look at a uh, record player that can and will stink up a room. And that would be the Aroma Disc. I'm not looking forward to this one. In 1966, one Frank Stanton, by way of MGM, publicly unveiled the self-proclaimed replacement to the transistor radio, the playtape. The playtape was a portable device with a built-in speaker, which played what was effectively a smaller, non-recordable, two-track version of a four- or eight-track cartridge. Depending on your source, the playtape, and tapes, were first released in either late 1966 or early 1967. My money says the former. There were five types of program available on play tape. Singles, equivalent to a 45 RPM record, were issued on red cartridges. EPs, read mini greatest hits compilations or super condensed albums, were issued on black cartridges. Children's releases were on blue cartridges. Near LPs, no more than 24 minutes, were issued on white cartridges, and educational releases were on gray cartridges. The big idea with play tape was to market it almost strictly as a portable format and primarily to young people. With that in mind, the most common play tape machine was what I believe to be the first, namely the play tape 1200 which retailed for $19.95 and was mostly sold at Sears. Tapes ran from $1 to $3 each. Or, if you were a Pepsi drinker, you could pull the cork lining out of six of their bottle caps and get the price knocked down to $12.95, plus get a free tape. Over the format's run, the machines were expanded to allow for a built-in AM radio, and by the end of the format's run, there were a few home units, mostly from third parties available. And as a little trivia, the basic play tape home unit also got used in a few arcade games along the way. There was also an optional car deck that could be installed into only your Volkswagen. By the time 1969 rolled around, portable 4 and especially 8-track decks had finally hit the market, effectively sealing Playtape's fate. The last Playtape units rolled off the line in either 1969 or 70. Having said that, Frank Stanton gave his idea one last push with a slightly modified, recordable version of his cartridge intended for dictation purposes. This was known as the Mail Call, released by Smith Corona. Thing is, there were already better, more versatile, and more common options for such things, and the mail call died a quick death. I've actually had this thing kicking around for a while now, but I've just never been all that happy with its performance, but I'll get to that in a bit. This is the Ultra Common Playtape 1200, and I have good reason to believe that this came from the great Pepsi promo of 1967, as not only is this the right unit, uh, the right model, 
Um, those units all came with a tape, a free tape, of the Lovin' or a Loving Spoonful. And it all seems to line up. But anyway, what got me to pick this particular unit off of good old Flea Bay, I was picking fleas again, uh, was the fact that A, it was still in its original box, although, yes, it was used, and B, it came with two tapes, one of which you just saw. And the other one is uh, what was at the time a mystery tape, and I could just kind of tell by looking at it that I wasn't going to have much luck with it, so I preemptively took it apart, and sure enough, I had probably about two feet of tape that had backed up and rumpled up accordion-style with the roller, and I wound up having to cut that out, but uh, I eventually found that this was Herman's Hermits. And uh, the whole shebang here was, I think, $20 plus another 15 for shipping. But anyway, uh, when I first got this, it didn't work at all. And this was due to the fact that the springs, uh, you know, that the batteries make contact with, had rusted pretty badly. So I did my best to scrape off the rust with a screwdriver, and then I gave it as best of a vinegar cleaning as I could, uh, which just meant scrubbing it down because uh, I don't think the springs come out. I know the lighting isn't going to pick that up, but I just don't think it's detachable. So anyway, after that, the sucker, sure enough, came alive, but the volume was real nice and scratchy and uh, as best as I can tell the knobs are not detachable so in spite of that I nonetheless tried to spray it out with some deoxit and it at least reduced the scratchiness it, it's still there but the big problem was there were some pretty vicious and still are some pretty vicious crosstalk issues uh, to the point that if I have it picked uh, for channel two, it's really off uh, to the point where I think it's out of phase and uh, the frequency response, even within the context of something like this, is just totally wrong. But uh, let me take a bit of a detour here. This model is not capable of true stereo, despite having the switch there, and uh, which is especially funny given that it touts the eventual availability of stereo tapes. But the whole stereo thing just never came to pass because at the time that they were going to get the stereo tapes out, uh, the portable 4-track and especially 8-track were out and were doing pretty well and the ship had just sailed for something like this. But anyway, uh, true stereo... My mind's a little squirrely today... Uh, this is not capable of true stereo, despite the switch. If you were to plug in uh, some headphones or uh, some computer speakers into the speaker jack here, you are only going to get the left channel. So basically, it's, uh, it's a misnomer. When you hit stereo, it just plays channels one and two at the same time. You know, two-track cartridge, one program of mono apiece. But uh, getting back now to the repair sort of stuff with this thing, I wanted to adjust the azimuth, the, the angle of the playhead, and from doing a little reading, it looked like you're supposed to be able to take this apart largely with just one screw, and it's supposed to be down in there but either that screw got stripped at some point, or this particular unit has a rivet. My money says somebody was playing with this before me and managed to strip the screw, so... Unfortunately, at best, this would mean I'd be defacing this thing to get it apart and try and work on it, and at worst, just flat-out destroying it. And given that 90% you know, plus of the stuff that came out on this format 
was major label hit record stuff, it's stuff that's still available today, so this is more of a novelty item than anything else. If I wanted to play with this as an archival format, I'd probably be gunning for one of the home units, and uh, then I'd probably have a better shot at fixing it. But, uh, yeah, that's kind of how it all worked out. If there's anything I actually like about these cartridges, it's the fact that these are all held together by a single screw in the middle, as opposed to an 8-track, which has, like, six methods of holding the cartridge together, and each one more frustrating and potentially damaging than the last. And uh, like a lot of 8-tracks, you do have the dreaded foam pressure pads on these things. And uh, like most 8-tracks, the foam on my two tapes had totally rotted. So getting it out wasn't hard, and I did that and I cleaned it out. But to replace it, what I did was I have some pre-cut foam pressure pads for 8-tracks. And, uh, because I'm lazy, I, th I think I got it from 8-track shack. And I took one of them and I cut it into quarters and then cut it again thickness-wise. And I just put some new tape on the ends. And, uh, that was that. Now, aside from that, these operate a little differently from 8-tracks. Uh, so you've got this roller, which is attached to this braking system of sorts. And when you pop it in, it presses down on this thing, lets up the lever, and uh, of course you've got this platter here that the tape lives on, and it's grooved, and it allows the whole thing to go around. And uh, there is no automatic program switching on a play tape, so uh, I happen to be at the end of this one, and as you can see, it's just a plain old splice because uh, you don't really need a foil one, do you? And uh, in my experience with my two cartridges, I found that uh, mine have gone a bit sticky, uh, not terribly, but enough to where I've been having to clean out the player after each use. And because of that, I think the tapes are extra prone to tension issues. And uh, that's, of course, from the occasional bit of drag that happens when you encounter a sticky part. So my final workaround was to intentionally loosen the tape loop, which uh, was an awful process. I had to undo it just a bit and then reel it back in slowly by hand and try and keep one step ahead of the new stuff coming out. And it took me half a day to do that. It's uh, not a project I'd really recommend. But having said that, prior to committing to the cartridges, I had considered re-spooling this onto a, a junk cassette and then just dealing with the quirks of it all digitally after the fact. But as longtime archive viewers know, I like to keep things as close to pure and period appropriate as possible. So I committed to the cartridges and I did everything straight from the deck, warts and all. And despite my troubles with all this, my final verdict on the play tape is this was actually some pretty cool stuff for 1966. Uh, indeed, had I been around at the time, I could totally see myself owning one of the units, especially one of the ones with the built-in AM radio. So anyway, let's finally close out this segment with a few, uh, out of necessity, rather brief clips from my two tapes all direct feed, and you can hear the best and worst within the confines of my unit of the play tape. And uh, when I say the worst, I of course mean the dreaded Channel 2. Seven times before, and everyone was an Ennery. She wouldn't have a Willie or a Sam. No, no. I'm a right old man, I'm Ennery. Thank you. 
A few months ago, I was digging through a thrift store bin, uh, looking through some records, and I found two copies of the same album, one of which was still sealed. And uh, it was just some cheapy Columbia Special Products Christmas compilation, you know, nothing that I haven't seen many, many times. But what piqued my interest about this one in particular were the first three words on the cover, and those words were... Aroma Disc Presents. And uh, of course, me being me, I uh, just immediately started having this great rush of thoughts going through my head all about, uh, wait, there's a turntable or a peripheral for a turntable that can cause an LP to intentionally emit a scent? Why have I never heard of this? But then I turned this around and read the back, and I found that this was just a promotional tie-in for some pseudo-incense machine uh, called the Aromance Aroma Disc Player. And uh, it was touting itself as effectively a uh, turntable for olfactory as opposed to auditory purposes. And I believe these things were made from 1982 to 86 thereabouts. Uh, I just can't find much useful information on these. But uh, nonetheless, my curiosity had been piqued enough that I actually went and bought both copies of the album, and then I went straight home and went onto good old Fleabay to find me a uh, player and some discs for it, and, well, let's drag ourselves kicking and screaming back to the Christmas of 1984, shall we? In case I haven't made it quite clear yet, the reason I'm covering this on the archive is because this thing was intended to, at least to a point, be used in tandem with media to create something of an immersive experience. So, for example, there was a buttered popcorn disc that was ostensibly intended to be uh, played, if you will, while watching a movie which, uh, now that I verbalize it, just sounds really stupid. I mean, uh, you could always just go and make some popcorn. But anyway, getting down to business, whoever owned this thing before me must have really loved it. And I say that because when I first plugged this thing in, and I didn't have a disc in it or anything, uh, it started emitting this tremendously smelly cloud of steam smoke. I'm really not sure what it was. But uh, within 30 seconds, it stank up Archive HQ with a scent that I can only describe as fermented gene And the kids will have absolutely no idea what that's supposed to mean. But anyway, I wound up taking this outside. Good thing I have an electrical outlet outdoors. And I plugged it in, and once again, no disc. And I just cranked it all the way up and I let it sit for quite a while and just let it burn off as much of the old junk as possible. And I don't think I'm soon going to forget that 95 degree day when I stank up the outdoors with 30 plus year old pseudo incense residue in the name of the archive. Unfortunately, that didn't completely burn off the old smells. And uh, worse yet, when I tried to dismantle the unit to try and just clean it out by hand, I found that I would have had to have undone some of the wiring and stuff to get down to the disc area. And I just didn't want to run the risk of not being able to get it back together and working again. So I'm kind of stuck. Anyway, uh, this, I thought I'd just bring out the box for fun, uh, this came with seven discs, and all but two of which have never been opened. 
Now, of the open discs, one is A Dozen Roses, which uh, I guess I could play in tandem with some Guns and Roses. And uh, then, of course, given the Christmas LP, the other one just had to be the Christmas Tree one from 1983, no less. And uh, I have actually tested this one out, and it also had the dreaded fermented Jean Nate smell. But uh, I've also noticed that some of the discs have gotten just a little warped over the years. And uh, also, despite these things being made to resemble records, there is no apparent uh, relevance to the center hole. And these don't rotate in the player or anything, and uh, as such, there is no need for, like, a stylus. So, in other words, this is just a cheesy potpourri machine. Now, as for the other five discs, the sealed ones, I have got... Fireplace, Winterberry, Nutcracker, Fresh Cut Flowers, and Gingerbread. And after just taking a whiff of each of these discs, the only one that smells anything even remotely like what it says on the package is the gingerbread disc. And uh, given the Christmas album, I guess that's appropriate. So uh, let's take a cut, and then we'll open this very disgustingly squishy disc, and I'll see if this puts me in the Christmas spirit in September. I know it doesn't really matter what album I use, but I would like to keep this as appropriate to the subject matter as possible. So, I have thrown on the Aroma Disc Christmas album. And sound-wise, you're only going to get whatever happens to leak into my microphone, which isn't much, and I'm going to try and have this only play for as little time as possible to you know, keep on YouTube's good side. But anyway, I've got everything all hooked up. As you can see, everything lights up like it should. Let's go ahead and do this. Uh, oh, this does not feel good. And it's stuck. It is very, very stuck. It is very wet. And as you can see, it's very shiny. So, uh, here we go. My fingers are all sticky. I guess we'll turn it up just a little, and we'll wait for this thing to get going. It should hopefully only be about 30 seconds, uh, given my past experience. Whew, that smells. You can just feel the excitement in the air, can't you? Or at least smell it. Okay, I don't know if it's just my hand or what, but I'm starting to smell something that sort of resembles gingerbread. Uh, very, very stale and very artificial gingerbread. We got heat coming out of the unit, and it, we got steam. We got steam. I know it's very hard to tell, but it is emitting something or other. Okay, so I guess I ought to throw on the record or get it going. Yep, 
There we go, we got some real good steam coming out of it now. How? It's, uh, it's okay, I guess. Let me turn that down a little. Oh, God. I'm feeling a little funny. Uh, I guess I better end this. Uh, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I... Well, I'm feeling fine.